Hey you guys, this is Josh and Carolyn with Homesteading Family and welcome to the Pantry Chat. This week we're going to be talking about garden planning for serious food production. Okay, well welcome back to this episode of the Pantry Chat and we are going to be talking about some serious food production in your backyard today. Yeah, I know a lot of you guys have this on your minds, it's on our minds as well, how to produce and harvest the most amount of food possible from whatever space that you have available. Some of us have large amounts of space. Some of us have little teeny bits of space. Some of some of you guys have balconies or patios where you can grow food. But regardless of the space you have available, there are ways to maximize what you can harvest from that area. And we're going to be talking about that today. That's right. So while these principles and things we're talking about today are universal, we're really going to be focusing kind of on the backyard garden. And yeah. then you can take it from there and take it down to the balcony garden. Or if you've got a larger space, most of this is going to apply as well. But we really want to see you guys that just are wanting to know what to do with your space and grow as much food as possible that's on a lot of our minds this year. Yeah. We're going to help you out. Great. So first, the chit chat. That's right. <laughs> what is going on with you here in the beginning of 2021? Yeah, well, it feels like a bit of a bumpy start to 2021. That doesn't feel super promising. <laughs> but, um, you know, here on the homestead, we've got a lot of planned for this year. I think we've got a lot going to happen this year, but right now we are still in kind of that quiet, deep winter sort of time. And so for me, the focus has been really heavily on homeschooling, getting through school, taking care of the things that we uh, need to do inside the household. And then of course, just keeping up with the food management, which, you know, once you get a lot of food stored, you still have to manage that your food mm -hmm. storage yeah, so the winter, yeah right? whether it's your jars of canned goods making sure that's getting rotated and using it properly and you know or it's stuff that's in the root cellar we've got some squashes out here behind me that are just starting to show signs of age and i'm thinking okay we need to make sure we eat these really soon so that's kind of a lot of what I'm focusing on. Right I gotta now. say, I'm loving having a lot more root vegetables yes. on the plate this winter. I'm really noticing that, that yeah. um, we've got a lot more onions, potatoes, mm -hmm. carrots, beets, and uh, that's really exciting because yeah. we've been working towards that for a while to increase that. We're gonna keep working on that, but just through what we put into place last year and through your management, we're just seeing a lot more of that. Uh, a lot more of our own vegetables on the plate throughout winter. Yeah, so that's far. really exciting. And, it, and it's looking like we're actually going to get a good ways through winter. Just I was taking stock here the other day and, yeah. and we've still got a bit there. So. We do have a bit there and they're actually storing pretty well for a pretty um, makeshift root cellar situation. We have a video out on that if you guys want to see what we've done. But it's just some boxes down in the basement and... I think it's actually going to get us at least through the end of February, storing yeah. the veggies well, which is a good amount of time through winter. So yeah, that that's really exciting. That's great. Yeah. But how about you? What have you been up to? Wow. Well, you know, 2021 in January started off with a bang with a flooded basement. Flooded basement. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Remember where we were just saying all those root cellar veggies? Were? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a part and of the reason I was taking else. stock because I was having to move those around because yeah. we had a water issue. And anyways, we survived that. It yeah. just feels on par for the season, I yeah. guess. <laughs> and um, so that took up a bit of time, but thankfully we got that resolved, no major damage. And uh, really glad for that. Yeah. Um, let's see here, you know what, a really exciting one, I don't know, scary maybe, is we have a new driver in the house. Oh, Our yes. oldest son just got his driver's <laughs> license. So that is a new one for us. We've got a large family, a lot of kids, obviously. And uh, for those of you parents that have, you know, seen kids, it's kids, your kids driving. It's really exciting on one side. We personally love to see them getting their independence and getting to reach out into the world and do things. We're very encouraging of that. We're not ones that really want to hold them back. We want to yeah. help them get out there and go. But it's a little scary, too. I had this very interesting experience the other day of waving to my son 
as in passing vehicles, he was driving and I was driving and I waved to him and I was like, oh, that's a new one. <laughs> I don't know about that, but but it's a good thing. He's a good driver. He is a good yeah. driver. He did great on his written test and the driving portion, they said he did great on, very yeah. solid. So we can have all confidence in him. It's I think no matter what though, just as a parent, turning them loose with a vehicle out there for the first couple of times is like, okay. Absolutely, <laughs> wow. it makes you a little um, nervous. But, but it's exciting too. So he's yeah. able to get out and start doing some things he'd like to be doing. Yeah. So that's exciting. And uh, my mind's been on that. And then you know what, just what we're talking about today, yeah. garden planning. Mm -hmm. um, not only are we continuing to settle this property as we move into our third full year. Mm -hmm. And I've always experienced and said it takes three to four years to really get a garden up and humming. So I'm excited about the planning about this coming year. And just even for ourselves with our large family, we mm -hmm. have never hit a place yet where we just say, wow, you know what? We've got enough space in production. <laughs> we don't need to grow any more this year. Um, we've got to keep increasing yeah. and um, taking new parcels of land you know, and putting in, it into production, and, putting it into production sure. and use. So a lot of planning going on there to do that. Yeah. And uh, that's great. It's a lot of work, but it's really exciting too. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I want to mention a few things to you guys right now, because 2021, I think has a lot of people feeling a little nervous, a lot of people thinking they'd like to grow more food, raise more animals. If you're thinking about ordering garden seeds and you haven't done it, I highly recommend you do that on right it. now. Yeah. The same thing with ordering any poultry, if you're going to bring in any chicks, meat chickens, anything like that, honestly, preserving supplies. I would not wait until summer or even early spring to put your orders in for these things because we're already seeing um, companies getting overwhelmed with orders. So if you're not one of the people already overwhelming a company, I would suggest you get in line right now. Absolutely. And when it comes to ordering animals, especially like chickens or turkeys, mm -hmm. we ordered a lot more turkeys this year. Just because you're ordering now doesn't mean you have to get it right away. If you're right. not feeling ready, like you still need to come up with a plan, especially if you're first time or something. Mm -hmm. You know, you, as a matter of fact, most of the dates are probably going to be pushed out anyways. And yeah. that's why you want to get in there because eventually they're going to run out or it's going to get pushed out really, really long. But you have some time. So don't think that if you're just ordering right now, gosh, they're going to be here in a couple of weeks. No. And yeah. you don't feel ready. Yeah. You, you've got, you can order now, just be realistic about what you can do, but then you've got time to prep yeah, for that. Yeah, you get to choose and, your and you date choose that you want dates. them to show up. Um, it just, you want to get it done. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Well, another note, some of you guys have noticed that the pantry chats have gotten yep. a little quieter. We're uh, decided to slow down a little bit on our video production because we have a lot of really excited th exciting things in the backdrop that are happening, but they're also taking a bit of our time. So we had to let something slide a little bit. So we're slowing down. We're not doing as many pantry chats. We're looking to do at least one a month right now, uh, at least for the first several months right. of the year. And then we'll go from there. But you know, any of you guys who are thinking about homemade dairy and that masterclass that we talked about that's coming out this hopefully September, that is in the planning phase. And we are starting to work on some of those really fun projects, along with maybe another project that we're not saying anything about yet. I'm ready to touch on that mm -mm, one. Huh? No, it's a secret. <laughs> but hey, the dairy class, we pulled you guys and gave you some options. And the dairy class by far and away was what uh, most of you guys out there in yeah. our audience was interested in. Yeah. And uh, so I'm excited about that. Um, you know, the dairy cow, if, if you have access to a dairy cow, and even if you just have access to buying good quality, you know, raw dairy, that can be next to the garden, that can be one of the most profitable centers yeah. of the homestead as far as a return on your work and your investment. Dairy yeah. is huge for us. Absolutely. And um, and so if you've got access to that, if you're thinking about that, that's it's a great option to be considering uh, right now. Yeah. Very well, good. Yeah. Okay, well, we better dive into garden planning for serious food production because we have a lot to talk about. Yes, we do. Yeah. All right. So I know this year, like I've already said, a lot of you guys are concerned about maximizing your food production in your space, wherever it is. And I think that's a really good thing. You know, the, the world seems a little shaky, a little you know, I don't know, not so stable as it has been in our past. And it's certainly in 2020, we watch things become unavailable. 
For some of us in the first world countries, that was kind of a new experience. All of a sudden we couldn't get what we wanted. It just wasn't available. And so I think a great way to respond to that is just to take a positive step forward in increasing your own food security by making the most out of the space that you have. So we've got, I don't know how many uh, really important keys to doing that, but uh, we're going to start start going through them right here <laughs> all right what's the first one okay so all right we're ready to dive right in then yeah. um you know we're going to start with planning yeah. and and we actually sent out a poll not too long about what you guys wanted to know regarding planning a garden yeah. and so we're going to cover your top items in here and that just starts with planning your space yes and uh before you get going before you do anything before you order seeds you really just need to plan out your space. Yeah, so you need to know where you're going to grow, right? Right. And for some people, that means that you just have that little balcony space. And for some people, that means that you have, you know, that big gar backyard garden. But if you are starting brand new, there's some things you really need to think about if you're just putting in a garden. Right. So you want to start with, if you're on new ground that you've never used before, you want to do a basic soil test. Okay. And and uh, just a basic pH test and maybe a real simple test from your local extension or something like that, just to make sure everything's in order. Now, if you've been on the ground, you know it, you've used it, and you're comfortable, great. Just go right ahead. Yeah. But if it's brand new ground to you, it's good just to make sure you don't have any major problems. And so that's that's the first place to go to. I don't have a particular test just for pH. Get a local test at your garden supply. And your extension can also get you a basic soil test if you want to go to that level. Okay. But that is a great place to stay. So that's start. just to know if, like you said, just if you're outside of normal range on anything. That way, if you have some major problems, you can take right. steps right off to fix that. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you can geek out on this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I, I love soil and I get into soil, but I don't geek out on all the technicals. Yeah. You want to make sure your pH is in that good range, 6.5 to 7, you know, it can be a little out there, mm -hmm. um, you know, and make sure you have the basics in your soil. You don't have any salinity problems or sulfur problems or whatever. That, that from my point of view, that's the main reason to do that. You can certainly geek out and get into specific pH for every plant and specific minerals right. and nutrients for every plant. That's a little bit much for all of us to do. <laughs> so I don't encourage you going down that path until you're way down the road, if that's interesting to you, but just making sure you got a good foundation to right. work from. You can improve your soil, which we'll talk about in a minute, as long as it's, you know, in a reasonable range. Right. Yeah. Okay. So then you need to make sure that you have adequate sunlight. And this is really a major key to gardening, especially if you're trying to pick the space that you're going to use. So I think you need at least six hours of sunlight, at least. That's the general the rule. You, you need a space that's got at least six hours of sunlight. Now, there are a lot of things that can take less. Yeah. And there are a lot of things that need more. And a great tool, besides just observation on your property, is an app called the Sun Seeker. Oh, and okay. that can actually show you your your sun angles, your coverage throughout different times of the year. Oh, that's you nice. Can, you can just get that on your phone and that can help you. And you, you can even see over your house and kind of see where the shadows are going to be. Because you've got three areas. You've got areas that get solid sunlight, you know, most of the day or a solid chunk of the day. You've got partially shaded and then you've got nearly fully shaded, which is going to be the north side of your house or a tree or something like that here in the northern hemisphere. And so you want to know those areas to plan out your space. Because mm -hmm. there are, you know, a few things that can grow in full shade, not very much. There's yeah. quite a bit that can grow in partial shade. And then, you know, a lot you can do within full sun. Okay. And then there's ways that you can plant those, those plants mm -hmm. in order to take more advantage of the sun. So you can, you can continue to uh, work with your sun and the available sun that you have by arranging your plants so that your taller plants are not shading out mm -hmm. your smaller plants. Right. So Absolutely. And then you can also get into, when you're thinking about space, not just two-dimensional. We tend to think very two-dimensionally, yes. but we want to start thinking three-dimensionally. And when you're in a small space, this gets very, very important that you want to grow up. And exactly right. what you were saying, you've got plants that grow vertically mm -hmm. and shorter. You don't. You want to make sure those vertical plants aren't shading out other things, but you can also strategically put those vertical plants in particular places right. and grow things under them. Yeah. Okay, good for cooler temperatures, even. 
Well, you can create cooler temperatures. Yeah. You can take advantage of hotter temperatures. You can do a whole lot by moving things around and taking advantage of that three-dimensional space. those different spaces. Yeah. So that's really important to know because there's a lot of places, a lot of you guys are in places where it's really hot is actually some of the problems that you have. Mm -hmm. And you need to provide for some crops cooler, shadier places. And maybe that's your problem. Maybe your problem is having too much sun and too much heat. And you can know that you can use other plants in order to provide some of those ideal environments. Sure. One one thing we did a couple of years ago, we were in California taking mm -hmm. care of a family member and I did a very impromptu garden yeah. and I grew lettuce under a decorative plum tree. And it was almost fully shaded and it did great. It, it was, was a lot of fun. Happy. <laughs> it was very happy. And likewise, in our environment now, we need to take advantage of the sun. So sometimes a vertical wall that gets a lot of sun yes. can be a great environment. I yeah. know a lot of you, like if you live in the suburbs, you'll have a wall with a sidewalk or something. And maybe that gets good sun, sun exposure. That can be a great place for some potted, trellising, heat-loving plants. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so we get we just get those wheels turning, looking at those different spaces creatively. Now, I know one thing that's really important to me as the person who's cooking with the vegetables is to make sure that your garden is accessible and ideally viewable from at least the house, but if you can make it viewable from your kitchen spaces, it's that much better. And the reason for that is, is, you know, you're standing there, you're chopping vegetables for dinner and you look out and you're like, oh, I'm going to run out and grab some of the herbs that I have growing outside, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. Being able to regularly see your garden reminds you that it's there. <laughs> it might remind you that it needs care. Mm -hmm. You know, you look out and you're like, oh, I'm going to run out and just spend five minutes weeding or I really need to water today or whatever it is. But the, the more you can see it and interact with that garden, the more successful you are going to be in the long run. So somewhere where you can see it from the house and ideally from the kitchen. Now, obviously that's working in ideals. We don't all have the ideal circumstance. So you kind of have to do what you have to do. But if you have the option, put it close to the house. Well, and we've got a lot of things to juggle here. So yeah. you, you're definitely gonna have to take all these tips and prioritize them with organization based on your space. But mm -hmm. the other side of that is getting it as close to the house as possible. Yeah. And the things that you're gonna harvest most or that you're gonna harvest daily, you want closer. The things that are maybe a once a year harvest, you can put out a little bit further. Right. And again, like Carolyn's saying, that is going to keep you a lot more engaged in the garden yeah. and it's gonna make your work less actually. Yeah. It's going to increase your enjoyment, too, because you're going to like looking out and seeing your vegetables. Oh, yeah. It is so much fun. It, it's very rewarding to see them there in a green space. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Uh, another tip when you're making beds, your garden beds or your garden plots, try not to go wider than 36 inches. Leave yourself space on each side. That's just to make ease of use so that you can reach in from a squatting position very easily and get to things. Now, we tend to think very linearly mm -hmm. <clears throat> with gardens and just a big garden plot and straight rows. But if you're in a backyard garden, um, you may have to take advantage of a lot of niches and different yeah. spots. And so you, you might have to you know get a little creative. You don't have to have straight 36 inch rows, but try to make sure however you're shaping things that you've got access you know, from every side. Okay. Um, otherwise you get to trampoline things, you get uncomfortable. Um, it just makes it a lot more challenging. If you're working in maybe a suburban backyard, you may have existing little, you know, flower beds around the edges of a lawn or something like that. And if it's getting full sun, you can definitely use those spaces to grow vegetables. But again, you have to be careful that, you know, sometimes those get really far reaching back into the corner to where the fence goes yeah. or something like that. You need to be able to harvest what you're planting and work with it, weed around it and do things like right. that. So you might just make a path back in there if it's mm -hmm. too far and make yourself a narrow little path that you can access. Yeah. And if that bed is just naturally deeper because you're working with existing yeah. conditions. Okay. Uh, another one, which we mentioned already, is to grow vertically. Yes. Is to start looking at how to get things growing up, not just out. Take advantage of that space up, which would be things like uh, pole beans instead of growing all bush beans, which mm -hmm. are low growing. If you're growing the pole beans, you get to get all of that growing space up. You can trellis squash. You can grow peas. Tomatoes uh -huh. you can get growing more vertically, especially if you'll grow the indeterminates. Yeah, cucumbers. cucumbers you can grow and you can thin them 
so that you can get some light underneath and grow things underneath them and get them growing up. It's also nice for harvesting. I love it, it when is. we've got a lot of vertical growing and you can just walk up and harvest and you're not spending all your time crouched down. Well, I always like when I'm doing the pole beans, like it becomes almost an exercise, you know, start up top overhead and you move down and then there's something on the ground below it that you're harvesting and harvest down there. It becomes this very nice motion that gives you a full hmm. range so you don't end up with just this backache from, you know, kind of being <laughs> hunched over, getting something low. Right. Um, so, yeah. But you also gain a lot of growing space by yep. doing that. Yep. All right. Another spatial issue that a lot of you guys were asking about was protecting your garden from various critters. And so we're going to talk a little bit about large critters, small critters and microscopic critters. <laughs> um, and this is part of thinking out your space because we do want to protect the garden. Right? OK, good. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. So if you have a lot of large critters in your area, that's going to include things like deer. I know that's yep. a big problem in our area. Deer, deer elk. elk. Yep. Um, but, you know, maybe you have other largish type. Somebody was telling us they had a problem with wallabies. Is that right? I think it was well, wallabies getting into Australia, their garden. Right? That, yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's not a problem we have here in Idaho. But, you know, there's a lot of larger creatures and that can be people too. Honestly, if you have a bunch of kids running around, you may have to protect your garden from the baseball game that's getting played yeah right next to it in the backyard especially, especially if they're not used to having that garden around yeah. <laughs> if you're just diving into this so so that's just fencing you just got to think of the appropriate fencing fencing um you can order what's called deer fencing if you want an easy solution it's actually a plastic netting that's semi-rigid but it's pretty easy to work with and you can put it up quick people around here i see them do it with t-posts okay and a couple people can run it it's not like a super expensive permanent fence so that that's a great fast solution if you just look up uh, deer fencing yeah. and see if somebody has it locally or if they don't, you can order it online. But that's a great quick fence to protect from the large right. critters, whatever they are. Okay, and then you have your small critters, which is gonna be like your rabbits, your gophers, gophers yep. mice, yeah, maybe your household dog. Might be, your household cat. We've cat. actually had problems with cats as I've made beds. <laughs> these long beds i found the cats for some reason love them yeah just the way i started doing the beds the last couple of years they and really all of a sudden like i've them. got the cats that are there helping with all the critters yeah so <laughs> but here's the deal though is the cats actually when it comes to the small critters cats are the number one best defense we've tried all kinds of things yeah. and there are a lot of tools out there work nothing works like a few good we call them barn cats but outdoor cats on your property yeah. that um, you know hunt. They're not lazy cats that just sit around and eat and lay on the couch. <laughs> and cats love patrolling the garden. It's like, it's their favorite thing to yep. do. They love finding plants to lay under. And um, so it's like, encouraging the cat to be more of a cat, but then they're going to fix your problems too, right. which is really good yeah. as so, long as they don't dig up your plants. <laughs> so I had to get used to them, you know, disrupting a few things, especially where I was starting seeds, but right. it's worth it because we had quite a few gophers when we got here and we have almost none now yeah. and we've done very little trapping. Right. Now you can trap. And mm -hmm. what we found over the years and even talking to a few older guys is really the traditional clamp gopher traps when it comes to gophers are some of the best. You have to learn to use them right. Yeah. But those are some of the best. And then there's a ton of other methods. You know, one another thing we've done well is the the kind of hawk that goes on a pole, the kind of kite hawk. Yes. If you've got any breeze, um, we it's been years since we've used one of those, but that worked really well. That did in work Vista. really well. But yeah. just a tip. If you have chickens nearby, don't use one of those. Or the chickens will it'll, bail. It'll scare your chickens. Right. Okay. Um, Good. Yeah. And then the microscopic critters. These are, this is the bacteria, the fungus, the bugs, you know, so I guess maybe not all microscopic, but the little bugs, the pests that, that um, bother our garden. And that's tough because we want to be organic. We don't want to just be applying chemicals. So there's a couple of things you could do. One is improving your soil. Mm -hmm. Just like you, you know, the healthier you are, the, the better you take care of yourself, the more you're gonna resist disease and different issues. Your plants, your garden is the same way. The healthier the soil is, the stronger and healthier your plants are gonna be, and the more they're gonna resist those pests and diseases. And we're gonna be talking about the health of the soil in just a minute, right. but I want to tell you guys, we have a PDF download for you guys of, I think, 
five steps to a healthy garden, mm -hmm. something like that, that you can grab. We'll put the link in the description. We'll probably talk about it again because it's a great, really uh, simple layout on how to get a healthy garden, healthy soil so that your garden can be more resistant to yep. some of these types of problems. Absolutely. Another one regarding that is companion planting. Mm -hmm. There's a lot you can do. We'll talk about that in a little bit uh, that can help detour different pests and even some large critters. Um, along with, um, just real quick, com uh, compost teas. Uh, if you're looking for a topical because you've got a specific issue, that's kind of a deeper dive, but it's something to get into that's an organic solution that can help with those kinds of problems. In a lot of places, you can actually buy compost teas now. I've been seeing that nurseries now have yep. compost tea or you can buy a compost tea concentrate. So um, I don't know how biologically some of those active some of those are, but if you don't have any other option, they might be worth trying. It's worth trying. There's a, there's a large discussion there, yeah. <laughs> um, but you can certainly try and you can certainly make your own, which if you learn to do is going to work with your local biology, that's going to be the best. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right, so one of our last topics on space is getting creative and also using containers and container gardening. Yeah. Um, not just when you're in an apartment. I mean, that's a great place if you have no soil, but even in a backyard garden, yeah. you can take advantage of containers. There may be a lot of places. Sometimes, like I was mentioning earlier, you've got a sidewalk down a wall and that gets some good sun. You're in a cooler climate, mm -hmm. but you don't have any soil there. Don't be shy to use some containers. Yeah and plant something along that wall and build some trellising. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great option. You might have a deck or a patio somewhere that gets low, you know, gets sun on the deck and it warms it up. Um, that's another great place. I mean, there, there's a whole lot of areas where you can use containers to grow and you can even get creative about the kinds of containers. Well, even though we have a large garden and a lot of space, we experimented this last year with a growing tower called a green stock. The, the green stock, yes. Yeah. We've used that and I know a lot of you out there have used that and the yeah. green stock is a great system. It's a tower system that builds up in different shelves. They've got a couple different kinds. It's got a patented water system that works better than anyone out there right. as it waters very, very evenly. So we're going to leave you a link in the description for that. And they will even give you guys a discount if you're coming over from Homesteading Family. Oh, wow. And cool. that is a fantastic system. Yeah, I was going to say, we were really surprised at how much food we could grow in a system like that, mm -hmm. um, you know, per square foot, because it's that taking advantage of that vertical space, right? right? We were actually able to grow quite a bit in that, uh, that little tower. I was really impressed with it and it made it pretty easy. So there's a lot of options out there for uh, being creative with your space. Yep. And just that that's that one's going to cost you there's some low dollar ones five gallon buckets yeah. are great old you know nursery planter pots that they're not doing with anymore you could even use cardboard boxes and double them up I and mean, they're just get creative milk jugs for smaller things lettuces. i've seen people grow straight into the bags of soil that they just cut open the bags of soil sure. that the soil comes in from you know the hardware store especially for leafy it. greens that don't yeah. have to be deep rooted right. in larger plants like a tomato or a squash mm -hmm. so yeah just just get creative and look to see what you have available to maximize the use of your space there you go all righty i guess we better move on yeah i yeah. think so so Absolutely. now we're moving on to step number two or point number two the first mm -hmm. one was in maximizing figuring your space and planning out your space now we're going to be talking about planning how to improve your soil. If you are going to maximize your space, which means you're going to plant densely, and I guess that maybe we didn't dive into that, that idea of just getting as much into a space as you can mm -hmm. by using uh, the space three-dimensionally and getting creative where you use, you've got to improve your soil. This is the single most important thing to grow a lot of food in a small space. Really, it's the single most important thing for gardening, no matter what, mm -hmm. but especially when it comes down to maximizing space, you've got to improve your soil. And I've got to tell you, if you have really good soil, you can grow phenomenally large amounts of food in that mm -hmm. space. I know one year we took a very small bed, we brought in really, really good soil, some really good compost mm -hmm. and filled it. We grew in, I, I think, six to eight weeks, we grew 80 pounds of greens out the of- leafy greens. Leafy greens, out of yeah. what what size was that bed? It was about it was, 30 square feet. It yeah, was- About three by 10, something like that. Very- uh, impressive how much you can get into that yeah. garden. And then we 
cut it down and we did it again. We grew more in there. We had to put, give it a little bit of food, yeah. you know, some soil food. So you can do a lot in a very, very small space if you have good soil. So some basics, we're gonna run through this really quickly, okay. but there are some basics that soil has to have to have good quality soil. You need carbon, that's the foundation of life. Of course, in the gardening world, we call that humus, but really it's just carbon. You need oxygen, your soil has to be able to hold oxygen. Water, it's gotta be able to hold water. Uh, you need minerals, which is always there, but you may want to add add some, which we'll talk about in a minute, to supercharge it. Then it needs biological activity. This is one that people don't think a lot about today. Yeah. In today's modern world of gardening, we just see the soil as a structure, and then we add in fertilizer. Yeah, we um, don't think of it as being alive and having right, alive components right. to it. We want to develop good biological activity, and then we want to keep all the pollution out. Yeah. So again, that uh, PDF that we'll leave the link for for you in the description covers these things. So if we're running to it through it too fast, you can check that out and see that. So, OK, so you go to your backyard and you've done a soil test. Nothing's too crazy outside of normal. Mm -hmm. What are the steps you're going to take to improve that soil? Well, if you're going to do it quickly mm -hmm. and you're not going to take up, you know, composting, because that's going to take a while and it's right. a skill you got to learn, which we want to encourage you. But if you're just trying to get off the ground this year and get a garden going to produce as much food as you can, you need to just go buy the best quality compost that you can. Okay. And people balk at this. They don't want to do this. They mm -hmm. want to save money. And I get it. But this is the one place that you don't want to pinch pennies on. You want to find the best organic compost that you can find mm -hmm. and use it and buy it. You will not regret it. Yeah. Um, it, it, it will pay for itself in the garden. I've got to tell you, we've done this year after year when we've moved to new places. We've done it all mm -hmm. sorts of times. It has every single time always paid for itself within the first year with the vegetable production. Well, and one just real life example here real mm -hmm. quick, because people thought it was nuts when I was telling them I was doing this during the year garden we were growing. And and I bought, uh, we spent about $2,000, yeah. which we didn't have a lot of money. We, we were we were in a new place, um, living off of savings, trying to figure out how to develop an income, uh, growing our knowledge base. And I spent $2,000 on seeds and on soil amendments, compost and mulch. About so you can guess, seeds that, aren't very expensive. Right, yeah, so. 15 to 1,700 of that was on the soil. And I was sharing that with some of our neighbors that were new. We didn't know, and they thought I was out of my mind yeah. that I was putting so much into dirt. Now, I do want to qualify and say that this was a large garden space. So this oh, yeah. is probably much larger than your average backyard yeah, garden. It was a quarter acre or so. It wasn't yeah. gigantic. Anyways, we grow easily $8,000 worth of organic vegetables for ourselves that year. That is the power of soil. Yeah. And not only that, you're, 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 produ you're producing healthy food for yourself. So you're making yourself healthier. So... Not that you need to spend that much money, but whatever your space is, if you want to get up and going quickly, you've got to amend the soil and you need to get the best in there that you can and it's worth spending the money on. Um, if it's a first year garden, you can use up to about six inches of good quality compost. That, that um, is a lot on yeah, the top of your it, soil. Well, on right? the top, yeah. you can mix it in. I mean, I like to do no-till, yeah. but I've done plenty of tilling. I've done plenty of mixing that soil in. If you need to loosen your soil, go ahead and take several inches and turn it in because you do need to loosen the soil mm -hmm. if you want to get it going, especially on a first-year garden. Yeah. You probably don't want to wait for that layering, mm -hmm. um, you know, lasagna gardening effect to get going. So that's okay. where you would want to turn some of that compost in, then layer it and mulch. But... You just, that's the quickest, fastest way to do it is just get good soil in there. Good, okay. good compost. So let's say you just can't spend the kind of money to get that in there. Would you have another option I do. to yep. do that? Yeah. You got to get scrappy and you're going to have to work <laughs> hard. And that is to go find uh, a lot of manure, you know. Um, cow manure is going to be the bulkiest that's going to add to that, but you know, rabbit manure, goat manure, pig manure, chicken manure, mm -hmm. but to go find as much as you can and then find a lot of carbonaceous, um, green, not green waste, but, um, organic material, um, leaves would be great. Okay. Uh, straw or hay, just if it's clean, being okay. no seeds and no chemicals and try to break that down. And you're going to have to start this about eight weeks before you want to garden, at least depending okay. on your environment. But if you want to go collect all that, bring that in, mix it all up and let it start to decompose and then turn it into the soil. 
Um, that is a quick way to do it. You just have to make sure you give it enough time to break down. So okay. That's why I say at least eight weeks. So you're essentially composting in place. You're essentially composting in place. Yes, it's not going to be as balanced and well-defined as a good compost, right. but we've done this. It does work and it can get you going for a lot less because you can probably find somebody to get some manure from. But if you're in the suburbs or urban, that's gonna be a little tougher. And that's where, again, I'm gonna come back to the compost. It's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Whatever you do, whether you spend dollars or you go uh, do the hard work and the hauling, it's you've got to improve that soil. That That is key to your success in um, any gardening, but especially backyard gardening, trying to get it going now. Okay, so let's say you're working in a uh, pots in your on your patio you've mm -hmm. got some uh you know maybe even the green stock system or something like that and you've got soil in there sitting there from last year maybe even a small raised bed garden what are we going to do to fix our soil in there how how do we get ready for the new year well depending on what you grew and how heavily you use that soil you're going to want to change some of it out in those pots. So I would go for at least 50%. Okay. Depending on what you're going to grow. Now, if you're just going to grow some lettuces on top or something that are pretty easy to grow, you know, just take out a little bit of the top and add in some new. But um, you want to, again, you know, how far do you go? How much do you want to grow? Right. How healthy do you want those plants to be? The more you can change that soil and those potted conditions, the better it's going to do for you. Okay. And then take that soil and go mix it into maybe a larger bed somewhere and amend that as well for or some maybe lower demand vegetables. Okay. That's that's kind of a rotation or a system that I would try to get going. Okay. What if you're dealing with some small raised beds in your back garden? Are you going to like are you going to try and scoop out 50% of the no. soil there and then nope. put more on there or what would you the, do? The there? difference with the raised beds is your roots can still go down in a pot. Obviously they're limited. Yeah. So and you know they can only go so far. So mm -hmm. you need as much you know nutrition packed into that soil as possible. With the raised beds, you still have access to the ground. Roots can reach down for water, they mm -hmm. can reach down for nutrients. Generally you're just going to keep building up because okay. most of your amendments as you get going, you know, they're going to settle over time. They're going to get used up and you can generally just add to that and after that first year of adding several inches about an inch per planting so if you're a doing compost. multiple plantings high quality compost um, should amend your soil very well good yeah okay great yep. perfect okay um, we've got one more here before we move on. Another okay. quick way to improve soil, but this is a big. This is a really good one. Is um, complete organic fertilizer. Now we are not proponents of industrial fertilizer, right? Um, and honestly, we've been moving to a non-fertilizer method because I believe that the nutrients are there in the soil, and we want to use the biology. But that takes time and work to build up to get that soil that healthy. So you can make your own organic fertilizer. Okay. And that is very, very powerful. We've also seen that work very well on first year gardens and early gardens. As a matter of fact, we're gonna be doing a little bit of that this year to just charge ours up. And if you just wanna Google Steve Solomon, complete organic fertilizer, there are recipes out there. And that recipe is a general recipe that's made for pretty much any soil condition as long as you don't have any major issues. It's, yeah. it's a balancer. So you don't have to worry about, am I too low on nitrogen or this or that or phosphorus or whatever, any of those issues. This is just a general good quality fertilizer. It works in sandy soil, clay soil, loamy soil. We've, we've used it in the different places we've lived yeah. <laughs> everywhere. And I would highly recommend doing that right out of the get-go. And any recipe you find should also tell you how to use it, how much. We won't go into that here. Um, but that is very, very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Good. Exciting right. stuff. I'm getting excited. I'm, gonna... I'm ready to like, get out of the garden and get going here. All right. Talking about all this. There are a few other elements to being successful for a garden, especially if you are really densely planting your garden. Mm -hmm. One of the things you have to realize is the denser you plant, the more densely you have those plants in there, the closer they are together, you know, your soil can support it because you just got it really healthy mm -hmm. and really charged up, but it's going to use a lot more water out yes. of that soil. And so before you start planting densely, before you really have this highly productive garden, you need to make plans on how you're going to handle 
you're watering. Don't wait until your plants are wilting before you try to figure out what you're going to do about it. Absolutely. So you need to have a plan. Mm -hmm. The average garden needs about an inch of water per week. That's just okay. a across the board, you know, average vegetable garden. That's about what it needs. Again, you can geek out and figure out this planting, whatever. Um, that's just a bit much for both of us. So if you think about it, an inch of water per week on average, unless you are in sandy, dry conditions, <laughs> yeah. which we've dealt with that. It can take a lot more. Yeah. And like Carolyn's saying, if you're going to be really packing it in and trying to maximize your space, you're also probably going to need a lot more water. Yeah. And you just have to go by feel to figure out what that is. Okay. So there's a couple of things you need to do. Um, one is you need to be checking your soil regularly. And two things. One, is not assuming that just because it's damp on top, that it's moist all the way through. Uh, that, okay, so you need to dig down a little you bit. You need to dig down a little bit because a lot of times you've watered or you've gotten a rain and it felt like a good rain, mm -hmm. you know, or you turn the sprinkler on for a little while and it looks nice and wet and everything looks happy and the yeah. soil looks moist and you go down and you're scratching it an inch deep and you'll find quarter inch, half inch down, then it's dry for Ooh, an inch or two. It's not good. And that can really trick you. So yeah. you've really got to be careful and dig down and find out where is the soil actually moist you know, hopefully it's close to the top, but, you know, it might be an inch down, might be an inch and a half down. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to check that. Yeah. Okay. The trick to watering well is watering more, less often. Watering more, less often. Right. Okay. So instead it. of watering every day or every other day, mm -hmm. water once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. you know, if for got, a longer amount of time. Right. Exactly. And this is in general. Again, if you've got like sandy soil, you might be through, you might be every other day, yeah. heavy watering, depending on your soil. We had a garden like that yeah. in Bonita Vista yeah. and it really needed watering, soaking every other day because the, the soil was so poor, especially the first couple of years. Um, but you want to water um, heavier by heavier. I just mean more water and let it soak in and soak down and uh, really nourish the plants deep down. That also encourages their roots to go down deeper mm -hmm. and makes them more resilient where they're out finding water and nutrients. Okay. If you water shallow every day, those roots stay near the top. Mm -hmm. They've got very little re resiliency and they're actually not going out and looking for more nutrient. Yeah, so you're actually forcing them to reach down for that water, Yeah, which is good. Yeah, yeah, it's developing their root base. Mm -hmm. They're stronger. They'll ha they're healthier. They can mm -hmm. take wind. They can take, you know, a drought. You know, if you forget to water once or yeah. whatever, <laughs> it'll make a better plant. Good. Yeah. Okay. One thing I know people want to know about a little bit is watering system. Everybody's yeah. always asking about watering systems. I prefer an overhead watering. It mimics rain. It mimics nature the most. And that's what I prefer to use and have used most of the time. Um, however, if you're in a very dry climate or you need to really conserve water, soaker hoses and drip tape work great. Yeah. Um, they just are more to manage. Okay. You know, or if you're in a greenhouse, like in our hoop house, we use soaker hoses. Um, yeah. So I think the real key here is to make sure you're planning how you're going to water. Mm -hmm before you get the plants in the ground. <laughs> right. Make sure you know what you're going to do. Make sure, even if you're watering by hand, make sure you have the hoses that are going to reach all the way across your garden if you're going to do that. Um, because it's very easy to end up with stressed plants that don't end up producing well. So you put all this work into the soil, all this work into getting those plants into the ground, and then you let them get stressed by not watering them adequately because you weren't prepared for it. You actually are gonna throw a lot of work right out the window. You also need to understand, and we didn't put this in our notes, how much water, um, what you're planting, how much water it needs to get sprouted. Okay, corn, goes deeper. You can water it less often, deeper to get it out yes. of the ground. And that works great. Lettuces, carrots, beets, yeah. <laughs> a lot of other things are near the surface. And in the beginning, you've actually got to water them every day, sometimes a couple times a day if it's yeah. very hot to keep them moist and get them up well. Yeah. And so that's part of that planning is knowing, okay, if I'm going to grow a lot of leafy greens or a lot of carrots, I need to have a plan for that because I am going to have to get out there or, or I'm going to have to have a timer on or something mm -hmm. that lightly waters to keep the seeds moist. Yeah. And there are a lot of timers. Timers can be very helpful. And so you don't have to have a fancy expensive system. You can get a hose timer on a sprinkler 
to help make sure you're getting um, your watering down to the timing you need in case you've got to go off to work or whatever it is you have so to you do. So you don't necessarily have to put in big fancy irrigation systems. Right. So you can just go to your hardware store, get a few pieces with a hose, a yep. hose timer, a little sprinkler that sits on the ground and have it work yes. for you. One last one before we move on. Okay. I know we need to move on, but the other thing you need to think about in planning your watering system and with the seeds that you're sprouting is those small seeds can't take very well the heavy water from a large rotational sprinkler or one of those oscillating, which those can work great for a garden that's a little more mature. Right. But you need something that sends out you know smaller droplets. And there's plenty of over-the-counter options in your garden supply store, but you just need to think about that if you're planting a lot of shallow, small seeds, because those water drops will push them and knock them around, even yeah. when they're starting to sprout, will actually keep them from taking root. Oh, so you got to consider and how that, you're that is especially important with those little seeds, those carrots, those lettuces, like Josh yeah. was saying. So um, you just have to protect those guys while they're little. A great way to do that is actually to cover them with something get the soil damp and then cover them with something a little bit so that they don't dry out so fast, but they also don't get moved around by any water. So yeah, you can really do that. You just got to give them a little more attention yeah. so that they don't get scorched or something once they start to sprout. Okay, so we still have a little bit to cover here, but I think this is all going to go together to help a really productive garden this year. Yep. And that is plan when you will plant. Now, this is really important because a lot of people think of their garden as, you know, we get around to the last frost date, we put our seeds or our transplants in, we harvest that, and then we're done, right? Sounds the, nice. It sounds nice, sounds <laughs> easy, but the reality is, is in most areas of the country, you can get three plantings into your garden. Sometimes more. Sometimes more. You can get the early spring when it's still too cool for your main season vegetables. You can get uh, greens, brassicas. There's a lot of things, peas, a lot of things that love that cool weather mm -hmm. and can handle the freezes or uh, frosts at least. And then you've got your main season things like your tomatoes that really need that heat and are not going to handle a frost at all. But then you also have your fall season. And even for some of you guys, you can go straight through the entire winter, right back into the early spring, because you've got things like, again, your kales, your brassicas, your mustards, things like that. Mustard's actually a brassica, but you know, things that, uh, spinaches, things that love that cool weather and do really well. So you wanna make sure that you don't allow spots in your garden to sit empty when something could be growing in there. Absolutely, so you're taking advantage of space and time here yes. to grow more often. So if you want to grow more food, you've got to plant more seeds more often throughout the season. And uh, like Carolyn was mentioning, you have the, these three basic core times, but you can also be planting throughout the whole season. Um, we actually plant once a week, a lot of times during the season to take advantage of spreading out our lettuce growth. Mm -hmm. uh, carrots, beets, even potatoes. Mm -hmm. We'll break that up a little bit to get more fresh we don't, eating. We don't plant potatoes once a week, but we do no, plant no, 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 them no. multiple yeah, times. Right. Yeah, I might have mixed <laughs> yeah. that up. We don't, you know, lettuces and leafy greens we will. Yeah. Carrots and the root crops we don't, but we'll plant them a couple times in the season, not mm -hmm. just for harvesting once and storing, yeah. but for eating fresh. Because again, like lettuce, you can harvest carrots when they're small. Yeah. So if you have enough space, you can, you can plant um, several iterations, okay? Yeah. Now, a lot of you are going, you know, how do I know when to plant and what to do? And this is where you need a uh, planting, a garden planner or a slide chart. We really like Clyde's. You can see this Clyde's garden planter. And this gives you lots of information for all your main um, vegetables that you're going to plant based on frost dates. You know, something that is so uh, important about a planner like a slide planner is that not only does it show you when you should be planting out your plants the first time, but it shows you the harvest, expected harvest dates as, as well. Right. The importance of that is that, I mean, one, you know when you're going to be getting things into the kitchen roughly, but you also know when you're going to be able to plant something else into those garden spaces after you have harvested. So you can yep. look ahead and plan, okay, you know, I'm going to be able to harvest this thing maybe mid-June. 
what can I get into the garden in that space after mid-June to grow on for the rest of the season? And, um, you know, something like a garden planner, like Clyde's garden planner is really going to be super helpful in that. That way, not only are you using your space as well as you can, filling out your space mm -hmm. all the way, you're filling out the time that you have throughout the season inside that space. Yep. So that is a, a major key to filling your garden, getting the most that you can food-wise out of a garden in a season. Absolutely. Okay. Well, All right. Well, we know we're getting down here <laughs> a little bit and we're taking a bit of time today, but this is really important stuff and this is really going to help you get out there and just maximize your space. And so we got to cover one more topic and it's okay. a little bit of a big one, but plan what you're going to grow. Now we're getting into the part that everybody loves and that yeah. is to the seeds. What am I going to grow? Picking what am I going to put in the soil? What do I get to eat or what yeah. do I get to put up? And, you know, surprisingly enough, you might have heard us say this before, it's not the prettiest picture in the seed book. That's how I like to pick seeds. <laughs> like, wow, look, they're purple. I didn't know they came in purple. <laughs> not me. I'm the bean counter and I want to know how much are we going to get for the work that we're doing. <laughs> Absolutely. And even that might not be your number one priority. Yeah, not always. Yeah. Number one priority is to know what grows well in your area. Right. right? Don't don't fight your climate too yeah. much, especially getting started out. And especially if you are growing with a bit of a survival mentality or right. look, I want to get as much fresh food and as much put up as I can, then you need to work with your environment. Right. You can always develop systems over time to, to grow the other things. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of creativity to put to work there. But right now, you want to get a lot of food in, you need to work with what grows well in your area and in your specific location. To find that out, a great way to get a better understanding is to ask other local gardeners, what grows really well for you every year here? Mm -hmm. You know, when you find that out, focus on those things, make the other things that don't grow as well smaller. Right. Yeah. Check out your hardiness zones. And then once you know your average first or your average last frost date and your first in the yeah. fall, you can also kind of understand your main growing window. And you can compare that to the things that you're thinking about growing the seeds and how long they take to maturity. And all of that can help you come up with a plan for what's going to grow well for you in your location. You also want to grow and select plants based on what kind of space you have available. Now, right. what you're going to grow in a little patio, a pot on a patio is going to be vastly different than what you're going to grow in a big garden space. Mm -hmm. So you have to pick varieties for the space you have available. But that can also mean um, picking, you know, variety or types of vegetables to grow based on the light that you have maybe. Maybe sure. you don't have a great space with the perfect ideal sunlight and you have modeled shade, you know, a little bit of shade all day long. You're probably not gonna choose to grow a whole lot of corn and tomatoes. Right. But there are a lot of things you can grow. So just when you're working with the environment that you have, you know, you're not going out and buying a new piece of property to put a garden on, you can choose varieties, you can choose vegetables that's gonna work best in those spaces. There are also so many um, varieties, hybridizations, and even open pollinated seeds that are developed for different yes. conditions. And so you wanna look at that when you're looking at the seeds and like, man, I really wanna grow tomatoes. That may not be the best thing for you, but you know, if it's really cold, but there are varieties that do better. So you can get into that varietal exploration a little bit mm -hmm. to help you out. Right, yeah. exactly. Good. Okay. Now, another really big one when you're selecting your seeds is to know their end purpose. How are you going to use them? Are you selecting these this particular vegetable seed just for fresh eating throughout the summer months? Or are you selecting it for putting up for preservation in the end? Um, it, that that's really important to keep in mind when you're doing your garden planning mm -hmm. because you can get yourself so many fresh vegetables that just don't lend themselves well to preservation. Uh, zucchini is kind of the classic example mm -hmm. of that. A lot of times people put in much more zucchini than they need. They can't eat it all. It's not really great to uh, preserve. It's not a really easy preserver. It takes a bit of work to preserve it in any way that people like to eat it again. <laughs> and so, um, so, you know, you just want to limit 
your fresh eating vegetables to what you need during those fresh eating months. But then you might want to maximize the space that you need for your preservation vegetables for things that are going to preserve really well. Your family's going to love to eat them preserved and you can get them on the shelf or in the root cellar. Yeah, I want to counterbalance that though a mm -hmm. little bit because a lot of people tend to grow for preservation mm -hmm. and then they miss out on eating fresh yeah. and on growing things that don't take a lot of work to get from the ground to the plate. Right. Because all that preserving has, you know, all these different places of different work steps. in them. <laughs> and, you know, growing leafy greens, growing root crops, a lot of those you can either eat fresh right out of the ground or you can store them without a lot of preservation and it's less work and you want to you want to you know find a balance in there as yeah. well and so that's where that planning really comes in think about how you want to eat throughout the year when you're growing throughout the season like we talked about in the last step and filling out your garden throughout the calendar you've got those ends of the seasons to be eating fresh leafy greens mm -hmm. and maybe broccolis and things like that so that you don't have to be dependent on the pantry. Yeah. So maybe you don't have to put quite as much up for preservation. So just make sure that you're thinking about it as you're selecting your seeds, as you're planning out your garden. How am I going to use this? How do I want to eat in June? How do I want to eat in September? How do I want to eat in February? Yep. You know, and plan accordingly. Absolutely. Good. Okay. Well, one more, and this is probably one of the most important ones when it comes to growing um, a lot of food in a small space next to soil. Soil is, you know, top of the Soil's list, the one. most important mm -hmm. thing. But the other thing that you can do is that companion planting okay. and figuring out what grows well to grow together so that you can grow more in your space. And we kind of covered this in talking about growing vertically and mm -hmm. planting things underneath, but you've got to make sure those things work together. And that's what we call companion planting. Right. Good. And, you know, sometimes this is kind of categorized as folklore and not really like a science oh, or something yeah. that actually works. But it is actually a very, very important method to keep in mind. And there's three categories. There are things that benefit each other. They mm -hmm. can actually help each other below the soil and above the soil. Okay. There's things that are neutral, which is actually the biggest category, which is kind of cool. A lot of things are just neutral. You, they don't really care. One you can way kind or of the mix other. and match them. Right. And, and then there are things that don't get along well together and they're detrimental and so you've got to stay away from those and but by knowing those you can really really helps you impact how much food you can grow in a small space and it can also help you deal with pests and problems when things like each other uh, they'll help repel certain problems or they'll actually help create beneficial bacterial environments or fungus environments that help each other out yeah the deal is this companion planting is a pretty complex yeah. subject. There's a <laughs> ton big. of information. It's a hard place to get started. And one of the best places for all around learning about that, uh, along with a lot of other subjects, is How to Grow More Vegetables by John Jevons. This book is an encyclopedia. Um, it's got a great section on companion planting that will get you going on the basics, but it also has a lot of information on everything that we're talking about today okay. in, in planting strategies, small space strategies, mm -hmm. along with soil management. I mean, it's, it's full of great stuff uh, for growing as much food as possible mm. in a small space and making it nutritionally dense. And I do want to remind you guys that that Clyde's Planner also has kind of a basic version of companion planting mm -hmm. lists on it. So if you're looking to kind of just be simple, um, maybe you're not ready to dive in really deep, but you want to play with companion planting, there's some information on that right there too. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, don't forget to grab your copy of that PDF where we're talking about the five steps to a healthy garden. It's got a lot of really good information in it and uh, will help you to maximize your growing this year. All right, well, we hope you have a successful garden year. It's been great hanging with you, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.